Welcome to our periodic seminar series uh, exploring the new geopolitics of the Middle East, sponsored by CSAC, the Center for International Security and Cooperation, and uh, FSI's Middle East Initiative. Uh, this series attempts to explore the causes and consequences of changing patterns of competition, conflict, and cooperation across the Middle East, uh, both among the countries of the region and uh, as it relates to external actors like the United States. Uh, I'm Colin Call. For those of you who uh, I've not had the pleasure to meet before, I'm the social science co-director uh, here at CSAC, and I also head up uh, FSI's Middle East Initiative. And today I'm thrilled to introduce uh, Professor Joshua Teitelbaum. Josh is currently a visiting scholar uh, here at CSAC. He's kind of toggles back and forth between here and Israel. Uh, he's a leading historian on the modern Middle East, and he teaches and conducts research on that subject in the Department of Middle Eastern Studies at Bar Ilan University in Ramat Gan, Israel, where he's also a senior research associate at the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies. His latest book is Saudi Arabia and the New Strategic Landscape. And today he'll be speaking to us about the changing patterns of cooperation between Israel and the Arab Gulf states. Uh, I know Josh did not expect this to also be the day that Trump would also reveal the deal of the century uh, on Israel and uh, Palestine, a plan uh, that I'm sure, as many of you know, uh, is heavily tilted in Israel's favor and has essentially been declared dead on arrival, uh, but nevertheless uh, may have an effect on Israel's relations with its neighbors, and it'll be interesting to hear Josh's views on that, either in the opening remarks or in our question and answer <coughs> period. Um, as is our tradition, uh, we've asked Josh to, to speak for 30 or 40 minutes or so to uh, go through the presentation here, and then I'll uh, moderate a, a conversation between you all and, and Josh after that. So without further ado, Josh, it's great to see you here, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, well, uh, the Middle East is never boring. Uh, for instance, I've been upstaged by President Trump, who released his peace plan uh, today. And uh, time permitting, uh, I may have something to say on that as much as I can since it just uh, uh, came out. Um, uh, but Trump's peace plan may be dominating the news cycle, but it will not dominate my talk today. <laughs> okay. um, I'm gonna, gonna start by pointing out the slide here, um, if you take a look at it. Um, my wife Jacqueline uh, thought this was some one of those joke memes from social media. Okay, um, uh, this is, uh, as you can see, a, a greeting card for the Jewish New Year from the ambassador, the female ambassador to uh, Saudi Arabia, to uh, Washington from Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, Rima bint Bandar uh, Al Saud, um, and. Uh, if you have a historical sense, this is quite an amazing thing, okay? Um, the founder of uh, Saudi Arabia was uh, quite anti-Semite. He once told uh, a British visitor that the only thing worse than the Jews were the Shiites. <laughs> uh, King Faisal of Saudi Arabia would hand out copies of the notorious Tsarist forgery, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, to visiting uh, dignitaries. And for years, Jews were expressly forbidden from entering the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Now, that is no longer the case. Jews can enter Saudi Arabia. Uh, they have been able to do so for many years. Uh, there's also an electronic visa application. A friend of mine who's not an Israeli, uh, but is Jewish, got his visa in like seven minutes <laughs> online. Okay. Um, so basically, my talk uh, we'll try to cover how we got from King Faisal handing out copies of the protocols of the elders of Zion to Princess Rima sending out Jewish New Year's cards. And this is really the evolving relations between Israel and the Persian Gulf countries. I noticed you said the Arab Gulf. Um, I think officially the United States still calls it the Persian Gulf or maybe just the Gulf but I don't know, uh, we'll, we'll see. Kind of depends on the meeting. It kind of depends on the meeting, right. Um, I'm sure during the uh, Iran negotiations, you didn't call it the Arab Gulf, right. but okay. Um, uh, in the background here, we have, of course, the tensions with Iran, the Arab uprisings, uh, and a new round of Arab uprisings, actually, and 
let's call it the retrenchment, the new isolationism of the United States. And I'm going to be concentrating, concentrating on the most important country of the Gulf, Saudi Arabia, but much of what I have to say goes for other countries of the Gulf, particularly the UAE, but also Bahrain, Oman, Qatar, each with its own nuance. If there's time, I'll, I'll go into it. Not so much for Kuwait, for reasons which I'll explain, time permitting. Now, surprisingly, Saudi's <clears throat> Saudi relations with Israel have a long history that's not usually recognized. And only recently is this being explored in depth as archival material is released, retired Israeli intelligence officials are speaking out, and uh, Israeli politicians can't resist the urge to brag. The full story of these relations is still to be written, and we're learning a, a lot more as, as time goes by. So there are several recent reasons for these developments, but, and I'll expound on those, but I'm a historian and I can't avoid mentioning some home truths about these countries which greatly distinguish them from Israel's traditional Arab enemies. So if we think historically a bit more deeply about the similarities between Israel and the Gulf uh, countries, we can reach some immediate insights quite uh, quickly. Like Turkey and Iran, these countries never really shared the meta-narrative of Arab nationalism that so defined the core states of our region since the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Indeed, they were quite suspicious of Arab nationalism, particularly its Ba'ath, Nasserist, and Palestinian versions. Just as today, most of the Gulf countries share with Israel a mutual suspicion of the Muslim Brotherhood in its various incarnations. Israeli governments have been well aware that not all Arab countries hold the same, view, uh, same views regarding the conflict with Israel. It, early on, Israel realized that the Gulf countries were different. They were more interested in infrastructural development and improving relations with Washington than confronting Israel. They operated on a more consensual, tribal basis in a system that was an outgrowth of tribal values and societal norms. And uh, they were also not authoritarian dictatorial regimes. All contacts between Israel and the Gulf countries had their origins in the clandestine space. And those between Oman, uh, between Israel and Oman and Qatar even reached low level diplomatic relations after the signing of the Oslo Accords in 1993. Well, the Arabs have dominated the history of the modern Middle East, and they've been dominated by the movement of Arab nationalism. This involved a, a, a struggle um, for independence from the Ottoman Empire and from Western colonialism. But the Arab countries of the Persian Gulf, particularly those of the Gulf Cooperation Council, were not a part of this struggle. For these countries, tribal underpinnings were more salient than Arab identity. They were latecomers to the Arab nationalist discourse and the Arab nationalist identity project. And they all maintained good relations with the West. So they were really outsiders to the, uh, the discourse of the core Arab states of Egypt, of Syria, and Iraq. Um, for most of the modern period, the Gulf countries were reviled by the core Arab states as anachronistic others who were out of step with the determined march of Arab history. The Egyptian leadership was famously dismissive of the Gulf states. President uh, Anwar Sadat was, uh, was heard to have called the Gulf states jelly states, not real states. Mubarak was said to have remarked that there weren't, en there weren't enough people in Qatar to fill a small hotel in Cairo. And for years, famously, Abdel Nasser sought to subvert the Saudi regime. So most of these GCC, Gulf Cooperation Council states, have sought out relations with Israel at one time. And this was possible because the ruling families believed that Israel had the key to progress in one realm or another. And let me just say parenthetically, we don't often, particularly in the West, um, internalize uh, that these are states run by families. Okay, these are family businesses. 
They're big families, they're big businesses, but they're run by families, okay? This is Saudi Arabia, okay? Named after the Saudi family. It's the name of the country. It is The name of the country is the name of the family. There's only one other state in the Middle East that has that, right? Anyone hazard a guess? It's the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, okay? Someone also told me that the state of Liechtenstein is named after the Liechtenstein family, but I have to, I have to check that out. So, Waiting until the United Trump of America. The United <laughs> Trump of America. That could, it could happen, you know. Just, uh, you know, the, the, the taxpayer will pay for the name, you know, like, a, yeah. like on the hotel. Uh, um, so, uh, so these states of the periphery, we can call them the states of the periphery, not the core states, shared a certain otherness with Israel vis-a-vis -vis the Arab core states. Um, and this combined with a pro-Western, anti-Arab nationalist, and later an anti-Iraq and an anti-Iranian position to eventually make them what's been called in the political science literature, allies of convenience. So these allies of convenience, I'm quoting Evan Resnick here, these allies of convenience, unlike allies of conviction who share values, well, an alliance, alliance of convenience involves security cooperation between two states who may be very different, different ideologically, uh, even adversaries, in an effort to balance the growing threat posed by a third state. So each of the partners views as a greater immediate danger to its security, views that third state as a greater immediate danger to its security than is posed by the other partner. That's in political science term. It's, probably phrased more simply than that. Anyway, um, so again, in modern times now, we have these three political developments, a new American isolationism or retrenchment, the rise of Iran, aided by uh, America's acquiescence to Tehran as a nuclear threshold state, and the, uh, the Arab uprisings, which included the Muslim Brotherhood coming to power in Egypt, all these things brought these two unlikely protagonists together, Israel and Saudi Arabia, into clandestine cooperation. And if we look at some of these things, so if we start with the United States, um, and this has some history to it, it doesn't really start with the Obama administration, and I'll plug my Hoover Institution book, which is available over there, where I, 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 uh, I show it has some roots. I don't have time to really get into that. Um, but it appears, really, it seems to me that the, uh, and, and I realize we have an Obama administration official, former, so he could uh, perhaps respond. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, the, it seemed really that the Obama administration had made a strategic decision to lower its profile and commitments in the Middle East. Obama wanted to correct the mistakes of his predecessor in Iraq and Afghanistan. It seemed that he, I thought I turned that off. Um, sorry about that. Um, it really seemed uh, that Obama wished to scale back the, uh, the U.S. role to maybe even European proportions, at least non-superpower proportions. And to do that, he believed that a radical change had to be made. This involved a recalibration of the U.S. position in the Middle East. And in order to do, to do this, there had to be a strategic balance struck between Sunnis and Shiites, an equilibrium a balance of power. And his view seemed to be a plague on both your houses. The Iranians support terrorism in the form of Lebanese Hezbollah in Iraq, targeting U.S. forces, um, targeting U.S. At, at home and abroad. The Sunnis states at one time or another supported uh, Al-Qaeda, Islamic states, radical Islamic state, radical uh, Islamic movements, Hamas, and so forth. Famously, 15 out of the 19 hijackers were Saudis, and some of them had received help from uh, Saudi officials. And President Obama was explicit about this. In several um, interviews, in an interview uh, with The New Yorker, he talked about an equilibrium, uh, equilibrium developing between Sunni or predominantly Sunni Gulf states and Iran, in which there's competition, perhaps suspicion, but not an active or proxy warfare. And he told the Atlantic in 2016 that the Saudis had to share the Middle East with Iran, that they were free riders and had to pull their own weight. And of course, 
there was the Iran nuclear deal, which uh, uh, was an important part of uh, President Obama's policy in the Middle East. Now, in the region, this was seen, this whole move, as a potential abandonment of the Carter Doctrine, where the president had committed U.S. troops to defending U.S. national interests in the Persian Gulf, such as the oil fields, and later something known as the Reagan Corollary, where President Reagan um, proclaimed that the U.S. would intervene to protect Saudi Arabia itself. And um, this seemed in the region to be uh, contradictory to a series of promises made by US, every U.S. president coming in, into power since uh, Roosevelt. So for Saudi ears, this was a significant pro-Iranian shift. Instead of standing steadfastly by an ally, Obama was for a balance of power. He was abandoning traditional allies. For the Saudis, Obama was pro-Iranian. Prince uh, Turki al-Faisal accused Obama of pivoting to Iran so much that you, the United States, you equate the kingdom's 80 years of constant friendship with America to an Iranian leadership, which describes America as the biggest enemy. This was, for Prince Turkey, a stab in the back. Now, fast forward, uh, in the aftermath of the Iranian attack on the Saudi oil installations last September, initially it seemed that President Trump was following in Obama's footsteps. There, no, there was no response to that attack, which seemed, if you were following the Carter Doctrine and the Reagan Corley, this was time for, for, for U.S. action. Uh, but when later Iran organized attacks on U.S. sites in uh, Iraq, it appears that Trump finally moved to restore U.S. deterrence, at least somewhat, we'll see. Uh, there was an opportunity for a targeted removal of General Qasem Soleimani uh, of the Al-Quds Force of the Iranian National Guards, and uh, Trump took the shot. Now, Israel was also listening to this music coming from Washington, and it did not like what it heard. The U.S. seemed all too eager to please the Iranians. It seemed ready to accept a nuclear threshold Iran and was ignoring Iranian aggression throughout the world. Israel's advance, uh, um, Iran's advanced ballistic missile program, its support for the Assad regime in Syria, Lebanon's support for Lebanon's Hezbollah, Shiite militias in Iraq, the Houthis in Yemen, and so on and so forth. So Israel's security situation had brought it closer to that of a potential uh, that to, to, to that of potential, potential regional allies in the Persian Gulf. It became clear to leaders there in that region that Israel was an island of stability and a potential ally against common enemies, like the Muslim Brotherhood, its Palestinian incarnation, Hamas, like Hezbollah, the Islamic State, and of course, Iran. All the Gulf cooperation countries, particularly Saudi Arabia, shared these concerns. So, whereas once the Saudis feared the radical influence of Arab nationalism fueled by radical Palestinian nationalism, now Riyadh's threat assessment has changed. Iran, the Arab uprisings, potential instability, the question of how committed America uh, is to, to the region has given rise to different considerations that are now driving Saudi foreign policy. Since Mohammed bin Salman's rise to power in 2015, he's doubled down on this policy vis-a-vis -vis close ties to the very pro-Israel Trump administration. He's increased contacts with American Jews and probably with official, uh, uh, official Israelis in the clandestine area. Now, what about the Arab uprisings? This was very uncomfortable for, for Israel and uh, Saudi Arabia and the other, uh, the other Gulf countries. Saudi Arabia, Arabia basically led the Arab world's monarchies in trying to stave off the rising tide of the Arab uprisings. It's often called the counter-revolution. Saudi Arabia did not hesitate to roll across the causeway to, into Bahrain when it saw that its fellow uh, royals, the Khalifa family, 
were threatened in an uprising of the Shiite majority. It has even floated the idea of a Saudi annexation of Bahrain should the current regime, regime be uh, mortally threatened. So Israel fits into the Saudi view that Riyadh must seek new military and region, regional arrangements in the face of so many threats. And we can look at history to get some kind of zoom out, some kind of perspective on this, because this isn't the first time. Along with the British in Saudi Arabia, Israel was active beginning in 1964 in helping Yemeni royalists against an Egyptian supported revolution. Okay, this was an effort uh, uh, known in, in English as uh, Operation Sauce, in Hebrew, Mibza Rotev, maybe after the, the famous Yemeni hot sauce called Tzchug. Okay. Um, but this effort was coordinated by British SAS veterans and it was financed by Saudi Arabia. Uh, Israel's activity consisted of several Israel Air Force arms drops um, to the royalists. This was coordinated by the Mossad. Um, from 1964 to 1966, about uh, 14 uh, arms drops. So for Israel, Israel sought to maintain a friendly regime in control of the Bab al-Mandab Straits, or as friendly as could be at those times, and to keep the, the, the Egyptian army mired in the Yemeni mess. It would not be, be beyond the possible to uh, think that today Israel is somehow helping Saudi Arabia in a similar manner against the Iranian-supported Zaidi Shiite Houthis. The Bab al-Mandab Straits remains important to Israeli shipping, um, as is keeping the Iranians out of the Red Sea. Now, if we come a bit closer to, to the present time, in the 1980s, the Saudi ambassador to the U.S., Bandar bin Sultan, the father of the current uh, Saudi ambassador, uh, Rima, um, uh, he was active in bringing American Jewish leaders to Saudi Arabia. Several trips were, were made, and he hoped in this manner to get closer to the Israeli government. The American Jewish Committee served as an organizer in these and, and later efforts, which continue uh, to bring Israeli and Gulf citizens together. As the Iranian nuclear threat began to be concerned for both Israel and Riyadh, the press reported intensified contacts between the two countries, including possible coordination in case of an attack on uh, Iran, uh, excuse me, attack for, by uh, Israel on Iran. Now, we have numerous reports of clandestine meetings, um, I am, and I am convinced leaked by the Israeli side, um, of Saudi-Israeli contacts, particularly during the Omer government, 2006 to 2009. Um, this is also a, a period when the Israeli government begins to make some positive sounds about the Saudi, later the Arab Peace Initiative that was issued um, and approved by the uh, Arab League. In, 19, in, in 2008, Omer uh, offered to have a custodial committee of religious leaders from Jordan, Saudi Arabia, uh, Israel, and Palestine, and the U.S. administer the holy places in Jerusalem. The Israeli leadership for many years now already has been making several uh, statements concerning the common interest between Israel and the Sunni countries of the region. I would say dozens, maybe close to hundreds of statements. I'll just uh, quote to give a sense something uh, said by Netanyahu not too long ago. Uh, again, in the context of Iran. Iran, Israel will not allow Iran to get nuclear weapons. If Israel is forced to stand alone, Israel will stand alone. Yet in standing alone, Israel will know that we will be defending many, many others. The danger of a nuclear-armed Iran and the emergence of other threats in our region have led many of our Arab neighbors to finally recognize that Israel is not their enemy. This affords us the opportunity to overcome historic uh, animosities, build new friendships, new hopes, and allow Israel engagement with the wider Arab world. And this is a period, again, when there are many reports of clandestine meetings and, um, and uh, uh, coordination between uh, Israel and uh, Saudi Arabia. Now, from the Gulf side, here from the, the Saudi side, 
from about this period, Saudi-owned uh, news outlets, and they're Saudi-owned, and there's no, there's no real free press in, in, in Saudi Arabia, although the press has opened up quite a bit um, since early 2000. But official news out outlets, such as, um, or Saudi-owned news outlets, such as Al Hayat, Al Arabiya, and Al Shark Al Ausat, uh, published many articles calling for peace with Israel, arguing that the Palestinians have not been flexible enough, that only peace with Israel would give Palestinians an independent state, that Palestinians continue to miss opportunities for peace, that Israel has to be considered uh, legitimate. And there are many examples of these articles, um, including an article in Ashark al Ausat. I say Ashark al Ausat because Ashark al Ausat is part of the media group owned by King Salman. Okay, this is, this is his, along with Al Arabiya, Arab News, and uh, maybe uh, one or two others, I can't think of right now. Um, so uh, there was an article there calling to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, not in the least to call Netanyahu's bluff and see if he was really interested in making peace. Now, Crown Prince Muhammad bin Salman has said, here I'm quoting, I believe that each people anywhere has a right to live in their peaceful nation. I believe the Palestinians and the Israelis have the right to their own land. Now, some Arab leaders have publicly recognized the reality of Israel. The Arab Peace Initiative recognizes the reality of Israel. But this is the first time that I can recall that there was a talk by an Arab leader of a right of the state of Israel. In a way, this is a recognition of Zionism. So in May 2014, a brave Saudi publisher, Turki Adakhil, published an Arabic translation of my Hoover Institution book over there in the corner. Uh, um, this is a book on Saudi uh, uh, strategy. He translated the book. And this was despite uh, a vicious Twitter campaign accusing him of normalizing, in Arabic, tatbi, uh, normalizing relations with Israel by publishing my study. Okay, I made sure when this book came out, it's translated in Arabic, that it, it did say that I was, uh, was an Israeli scholar uh, at an Israeli university. A previous book of mine that had been translated into Arabic had said, had called me a Western observer. So uh, I wanted to make sure this was uh, more exact. Um, now, okay, so, so he published the book and, uh, and, and uh, he, was brave to do that. But Turki al-Dakhil is not just some guy, okay? Turki, Turki al-Dakhil, when King Salman assumed the throne in January 2015, he appointed al-Dakhil executive editor of Al-Arabiya. It's called Al-Arabiya, it's like the, the Saudi Al Jazeera. Okay. So this was a sure sign that publishing a book by an Israeli did not hamper one's career. And he's now Saudi ambassador to the UAE. So in today's Saudi Arabia, if you tout better relations with Israel, with Israelis, and even Israel, it's not an obstacle to much, particularly career advancement. For many years before he was pushed aside, uh, Prince Turki al-Faisal, I've mentioned him several times, the son of King Faisal of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion fame. Um, he's former head of Saudi intelligence. He is... Um, a former ambassador to the United States and to the UK. He took the lead on opening to Israel. He met openly with several prominent Israelis, and he even praised uh, former Justice Minister C.P. Livni at a conference in Munich in February 2014. He has appeared publicly with uh, Amos Yadlin, a former head of Israeli uh, military intelligence, and he's reached out to Israel in several op-eds in Haaretz, where he's struck a hopeful tone about Israel uh, adopting the Arab Peace Initiative. Significantly, he said in one of the, the, the later op-eds that um, the Arab Peace Initiative was no longer a take it or leave it proposition, as he had said it was before, and that um, any mutually agreed borders between Israel and the Palestinians would be acceptable within the Arab Peace Initiative. So this you call this a bit of a making the Arab Peace Initiative a little bit more uh, flexible. We'll, we'll see what happens now, of course. So when um, King Abdallah died in, in January 2015, 
Israeli fish officials offered heartfelt condolences, an unusual step for two countries without diplomatic relations. Now, as the Iranian negotiations became uh, clear and the nuclear deal grew closer, the relations with Saudi Arabia uh, grew uh, closer. The Saudi head of the Organization for, the Is for Islamic Cooperation, Yad Madani, visited the Temple Mount, the Haram al-Sharif, and uh, this can only be done through coordination with Israel. Um, uh, it, during this period in, 19, in, in 2015, we have more reports of uh, meetings with, uh, with the Saudis. And the Saudis were apparently pushing on the Arab Peace Initiative because even Benjamin Netanyahu told a meeting of diploma, diplomats that this was a, uh, could be accepted as general framework for peace, although parts of it were outdated and uh, would need to be negotiated. But he was obviously going towards the Saudis, at least in the uh, discursive uh, realm. Uh, Ambassador Dory Gold appeared publicly with a retired Saudi Major General Anwar Ashki a few days, just a few days before Gold was appointed Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Ashki runs a think tank um, and has had several military uh, positions, and they both stressed cooperation over uh, Iran, and uh, Eshki talked about the importance of Israel accepting the Arab Peace Initiative. Again, this could not have been done without um, Saudi uh, appro approval. And it turns out they've been meeting for over a year and a half when Netanyahu was a paid political consultant to, uh, uh, when uh, Dory Gold was a paid political consultant to uh, Netanyahu. Now, there are many ways these countries can cooperate. I won't uh, go into too, too much detail, but I think the first is in the area, area of missile defense. Israel's a world leader in multi-layer missile defense. The Gulf countries are engaged in, in developing their own uh, missile defense. Um, both Israel and the Gulf countries are aided by the United States in developing their missile shields. Israel exercises regularly with the US in battlefield missile defense. In their war against the Houthis in Yemen, the Saudis are regularly downing Scud missiles. Not all of them, but they do have some successes as well as some failures. So certainly Israel's advanced knowledge in this area can uh, be an area of cooperation. There were credible reports in 2015 that several Gulf states were even considering purchasing Israel's Iron Dome system. There is actually trade between Israel and the Gulf recently estimated to be around uh, $1 billion. Um, uh, these are exports that uh, go through third countries, uh, mostly Jordan, uh, Turkey, and Europe. So anyone who listens to the, to the music okay, of Israeli Gulf relations certainly senses a change, okay? I'll mention some of these things, and this is all in the in 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 the so, on, in social media, which is the new area of diplomacy, as as we all know. Okay, um, uh, Elchanan, Israeli uh, Israeli rabbi, actually Elchanan Miller has a People of the Book YouTube channel and a Facebook page, where uh, he explains Judaism in Arabic. Uh, it has millions of Arab viewers, many many from the Gulf. Israel's digital media platforms are quite popular in, um, in, uh, in the Gulf. Uh, on the Gulf side, rarely a, pro, uh, rarely a week goes by without pro-Israel comments in the press. Recently, and this is quite recent, there have been several visits by uh, Saudi bloggers to Israel, and they're not afraid uh, to publish the fact, as they do. They're, they're bloggers, they're influencers, as that's, uh, that word is used. And, and they they get hit for it, okay? But they do uh, they do uh, they do visit. One of these uh, gentlemen even sings in Hebrew. Okay. Israeli officials have visited Abu Dhabi and Dubai numerous times. There's an Israeli office at a UN organization in Abu Dhabi. In November, the Israeli national anthem was played in Abu Dhabi when 17-year-old uh, Alon Levayev took gold in the junior category at the Jiu-Jitsu World Championships. Two synagogues have recently emerged from the underground in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. 
the government of Abu Dhabi is building a synagogue, a mosque, and a church as a symbol of religious tolerance. Now, um, this week, uh, the world has been uh, marking International Holocaust uh, Remembrance Day. Uh, both Emirati and Bahraini foreign ministers tweeted messages on this day, uh, mentioning Auschwitz and uh, condemner, condemning racism and hatred. Expo Dubai 2020. This is scheduled to open in October. This will feature a full-blown Israeli pavilion. It's 1,500 meters. Its size is 1,500 meters. Um, it, the, uh, the, the slogan or the theme is Nahwal Rad, towards the future. Um, and this is gonna be right next to all the, the pavilions. As you can see, it's, it's quite huge. It's an artist's rendering. Um, Israelis may be allowed to visit under special visas. That's not set exactly. Um, but this is not a token matter, okay? Uh, getting this multi-million dollar pavilion off the ground involves hundreds of Israelis, Emiratis, cooperation, permits, builders, so forth. It's, uh, it, it's on the ground cooperation. Arrangements are underway to allow Israelis to attend the World Soccer Cup uh, the World Cup in, in Qatar in 2022, uh, using special fan visas. And just parenthetically, I'll say uh, as, I'm, as I'm closing, um, a lot of part of, of the discourse you see coming from the Gulf is the rehabilitation of Judaism in Arab Gulf discourse. Um, and uh, in, according to some, I am in touch with many people in the Gulf, uh, this is really seen as a way of uh, opening up relations towards Israel. Um, I'm going to skip some reference to the individual countries as I uh, conclude, uh, uh, Qatar, Kuwait, and others, in order to allow some time um, for discussion. So we know a lot about the music, but we don't know a lot about the substance. Certainly there's intelligence cooperation, and perhaps some defense technology transfers. Certainly in the area of cyber with the UAE, this has been widely reported since 2007. Israeli companies have provided cyber security products to the UAE to the tune of billions of dollars. Some of these systems apparently have been used offensively against dissidents. Um, Israeli firms were allowed to bid on a program to manage the flow of pilgrims in Mecca. Okay, just let that drop for a second. Okay, they, they didn't get the bid, but they were allowed to bid as an Israeli firm for uh, managing the flow of pilgrims in Mecca. Now, I think real cooperation beyond the clandestine is not likely to develop without some movement on the Palestinian issue, even of a symbolic nature. This is because for Riyadh, the, uh, as a leader of the Sunni world, the cost of an open relationship with Israel, which is vilified in the Arab world, is still greater than the benefits. My colleague Greg Gauz has often said that there's no reason for Saudi Arabia to have diplomatic relations with Israel um, because it can get from Israel what it wants uh, without diplomatic relations. As he puts it, why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free? But as we say in Israel, we're not suckers, okay? okay? Israel covets diplomatic relations with the kingdom in order to have relations with one of the most important Arab countries in the world. So if we continue Greg's culinary metaphor, I would say that uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia, when they do talk about the peace process, they're talking about how thin to slice the salami, whether it be halal or kosher salami. Okay. Um, in other words, what, what's the minimum Israel can do on the Palestinian issue that would not compromise security while still providing Saudi Arabia with enough cover to open embryonic public official connections with the Jewish state? This may take the form of non-aggression pacts. It's widely reported, again, this comes from the Israeli side that Israel has been discussing non-aggression pacts with uh, the Gulf countries. Um, maybe this new Trump plan is the cover 
that, uh, that Saudi Arabia is looking uh, for. Uh, the ambassadors of Oman, the UAE, and Bahrain were present at the unveiling of the peace deal today. Okay? They were present at the unveiling of the peace deal. Uh, just before I, I came in here, uh, the Saudis uh, commented officially, they expressed appreciation of Trump's efforts and called for direct negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, which is what's supposed to happen there. So as you can see, we've come a long way from the days when King Faisal distributed copies of the Protocols of Elders of Zion to foreign dignitaries. On International Holocaust Remembrance uh, Day, Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Karim Al Issa, Secretary General of the Saudi World Muslim League and a former Minister of Justice of Saudi Arabia, visited Auschwitz and prayed at Auschwitz, uh, leading in prayer several uh, visiting uh, Muslims. Now, cynics can say this is public relations, this is meaningless, but I think even public relations can change things. And of course, this would have been unthinkable a few years ago. Um, the day before yesterday, it was announced that Israelis would be allowed to travel, Israel announced that Israelis would be allowed to travel to Saudi Arabia um, uh, for business as long as they, uh, Saudi Arabia allowed them to enter and Israeli Muslims would be allowed to travel on Israeli papers. Now uh, for the pilgrimage, okay? Now they go through Jordan and they enter Saudi Arabia on Jordanian papers. Um, Saudi Arabia has said basically not yet, they related to it, but they didn't really confirm it. There's probably something in the works and as usual, Israel's, Israeli officials spoke too soon. Um, so Israel's established itself as a military and technologi technological powerhouse in the region, a defender against Iran and its proxies, a force to be reckoned with and even emulated. For several years, it has hit Iranian and pro-Iranian sites in Iraq, Lebanon and Syria to applause in Riyadh. For Saudi Arabia, which recently sustained a serious Iranian attack on its oil installations, this kind of Israeli activity is a blessing. In the Gulf, at least, pragmatism is, pragmatism is taking over from past ideologies, which, as I've contended, were never really very well rooted in any case. In a way, Israel is Saudi Arabia's proxy. And Israel welcomes these openings because it demonstrates that even though progress on the Palestinian front is stalled for the time being, the Jewish state can thrive and be accepted by more and more leaders in the region. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks, Josh. Um, I will open it up in just a second. I'm gonna take the chair's prerogative though to ask the first question and it relates to um, I think it's indisputable that common threat perceptions have uh, driven the sides together, um, uh, is the Israelis and the Saudis, but also the, the UAE uh, in, in particular. Um, but I wonder whether we're starting to see uh, an, a divergence on Iran. And let me flesh that out for a second. I think both the, both the Israeli side of the equation and the Saudi and Emirati side of the equation were, were, have been both thrilled and increasingly anxious about Donald Trump. So thrilled because he was willing to walk away from the Iran nuclear deal that Obama negotiated, reimpose crippling sanctions on, on Iran. They like that part. Anxious because they know Donald Trump wants to get out of the Middle East and they're not convinced that he has much staying power when and if their interests as opposed to American interests are called into jeopardy. So, you know, uh, the Iranians strike at Aramco, Trump does nothing. The Iranians kill an American and besiege the embassy, then we take out Soleimani, but the, uh, the, the Saudi and Emirati officials that I'm uh, uh, aware of do not believe for a minute that Trump will have their back if Iran horizontally escalates and does something against, uh, against uh, their interests in, in Abu Dhabi and Dubai and Riyadh or, or, or anywhere else. That's thing one. Thing two, you know that the Israelis were extraordinarily unnerved by Trump's abandonment of the Kurds in Syria and what that would mean for uh, his staying power across the region. Um, and the Israelis and the Gulf states have reacted in different ways, right? The Israelis have reacted by, by doing more on their own. So they've taken more strikes in Syria. They've taken strikes as far away as Iraq. They've taken some strikes in Lebanon. They are flexing their muscle against Iranian proxies 
knowing that they have nobody at the end at the end of the day to count on but themselves. The Saudis and the Emiratis have been looking for quiet ways to de-escalate with Iran, not to escalate with Iran, right? So the Emiratis have extricated themselves from Yemen, from southern Yemen. They've engaged in maritime conversations with the Iranians. There have been quiet talks between emissaries of the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman uh, and, and, the, uh, and the Iranians. So I wonder whether you see, as, as Trump still wants to get out of the Middle East, as Trump might bet, get unseated by a Democrat who would be even more anxious to get out of the Middle East, whether the pragmatism in the Gulf will lead them toward a de-escalation with Iran whereas Israel is likely to escalate against Iran, and that divergence creates some tensions in the very dynamics that you've talked about. Yeah, sure. So th that's certainly, it's certainly possible, okay? They don't, the, how they deal with Iran, Israel's idea of dealing with Iran is a more, you know, aggressive, more out there. Uh, and, and the Saudis talk, and the Irani, Emiratis talk a big game about being more aggressive, but they're, they're in the region and they're scared of they're scared of the backlash. I mean, they talk a big game, but they don't really have the capabilities. And if Trump leaves um, and America uh, leaves, they're kind of left hanging. So that's a situation that they have to deal with. And I think that will bring them closer together. And there may be some, some, um, some exchanges there. I mean, Israel wants recognition and diplomatic relations. So they would have to coordinate more closely on Iran. Maybe Israel in certain situations would hold back in, in, in exchange for uh, ratcheting up relations with the Gulf countries, I think. But I think what we have here is a, is a conversation that's going on, that they are talking to each other and trying to coordinate uh, activities and each viewing Trump's policy in different ways. They're not, their interests are the same, but they, uh, how they are implemented can, they, they, there can be a divergence there. Uh, I think I saw I hand it up. Steve Krasner in the back, and then we'll. Uh, so, um, yep. so obviously, I mean, big win for Israel would be formal recognition by Saudi and the Gulf states, but they're clearly constrained by doing that. So, how far do you think Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states might actually go toward Israel? All the things that you talked about are little these little steps based upon strategic calculation. But there's obviously a big ideological constraint on the Saudi and the Gulf state side. So that's, you know, that's like what I think they're talking about, how thin to slice the salami and how, how close together. So if they sign a non-aggression pact, pact uh, which has been floated, that might be okay for the time be being. And Israel may see that as, as an achievement, that the Netanyahu can Trump is to have non-aggression pacts, whatever that means, uh, with, with the Arab countries. Um, Full diplomatic relations may still have to wait for, for something, for something else. But, uh, but you don't necessarily have to have full diplomatic relations. You can have lower level relations. Yeah. Did you say something about the constraints that exist in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states? If they go, quote, unquote, too far, whatever you keep saying. Well, it's just, it's, you know, pretty much common sense. These are, these are Arab countries. Saudi Arabia is a Muslim leader. It sees itself as a Muslim leader and is a Muslim leader. And uh, Israel is, is the enemy. So they're not, they just can't do anything that they want. They feel a constraint. It's a, it's a political decision for them. Um, in Saudi Arabia in particular, there, there's a lot of things going on, as, as we know, with the conservatives. So this uh, crown prince who will probably soon be king is, is doing a lot of things that angers conservatives. So he's going to have to decide, and the conservatives don't support relations with Israel, okay? So he's going to have to decide it's a political calculation. Is it worth it? Maybe I can do something that'll uh, help the Israelis cooperate with me. Maybe it doesn't have to be full diplomatic relations. And I think that's the, what the substance of these talks are. The other countries are a bit less constrained. The UAE is less constrained. Uh, um, uh, Oman is certainly less constrained, has, has always felt less constrained. I didn't really go into that. But Oman is is a country that is, uh, has an orientation towards the Indian Ocean, that has a, a long maritime past that goes to Africa, that is Ibadi Sunni, not, uh, not uh, mainstream Sunni. So they, they sometimes are always outliers, as they were with the Iran deal, helping the Iran deal behind, behind the scenes. So maybe we'll see, we'll see uh, something there. And we may see something with the UAE. There are a ton of Israelis in the UAE right now, okay? You can go, there's a Facebook page how to have fun in the UAE in Hebrew, okay? <laughs> what to do in Dubai, what restaurants to go to, what? So, I mean, you know, there's this kind of 
music going on there. And, uh, and Israel, I have not been personally, but as Israelis go, they say there's just, you can't go in, a, officially you can't go on an Israeli passport. You have to use a foreign passport. Um, but uh, Israelis report there's no problem uh, speaking Hebrew. As you probably know, the UAE is only about 20% of its citizens, uh, of its residents are citizens. There's a huge expat population. So Israelis feel comfortable. And it's remarkable, really, when you, when you realize that in, in 2010 in, in Dubai, Israel assassinated a, uh, one of a Hamas uh, operative. Um, but that apparently hasn't uh, hindered these things. I was going to make a joke about always being able to travel there under Canadian passports as long as you just want to slap some guy from Hamas. Uh, uh, Udi, uh, and I would encourage everybody to uh, introduce yourself, uh, both because Josh may not know you, but also because the rest of us may not uh, know you. So, so thank you for uh, the renovations for uh, the Department of Labor. Um, Josh, thank you for the presentation. We tend to think about these as two separate arenas, uh, very far away geographically, but Saudi Arabia is quite close physically to Israel. And historically, there were Israeli vessels that got stuck on Saudi shores and so on. So does the proximity, how does it affect what you're talking about, the geographical reality? What opportunities it creates and perhaps what tensions or problems it may create? Well, um, I think that the, the main thing that comes to mind of proximity is this huge Saudi project to build this tourist city, Neom, in the uh, northwest corner of, uh, of Saudi Arabia. Uh, which is supposed to uh, bring uh, hundreds of thousands of tourists. It's going to be open. I think women will be allowed to wear bikinis. Uh, it will be, uh, and, and that's right up on the border with, with, uh, with Aqaba in Israel. And, and there's talk about some kind of cooperation. That's one area where, the, where proximity can really, uh, can really bring, uh, bring the countries together. I mean, um, even under uh, King Abdallah, uh, there was an effort to create these kind of extraterritorial areas. He, he established a, a graduate level university, which I know of Israeli professors who hold dual citizenship, who have cooperated with people there. I won't mention them, but, uh, but uh, so there is that opening. There are certain um, fields of uh, academe uh, um, that uh, Israelis are quite prominent in. And if you want to, uh, you know, be a part of that academic community. You have to deal with Israelis. You can't boycott them. So there is some co co um, cooperation in that area as well. Uh, Brian, and then gentlemen, go ahead. Uh, I'm Brian Messer. I'm a senior majoring in international relations. I'm also a deep back honor student, a professor of policy at Northeast And uh, my question is that you mentioned a little bit about the Trump peace plan and the fact that um, some Gulf ambassadors have to leave that now. Well, um, I think this, um, this peace plan uh, is conceived as a, a way to integrate Israel into the region. It's part of a wider um, uh, vision. I think it's actually called a, a vision, uh, on the, if you look on the document, um, for the region. So I think, I think this helps. I think that it, the more Israel is seen as a fait accompli, as is recognized in the region, the Gulf countries, if they want, can contribute also quite a bit financially to the success, to all these projects. This is a huge document with all kinds of uh, projects of cooperation that could certainly um, profit from, uh, from the, the help of the Gulf countries. Um, just, it, it kind of gives me the opportunity to say, again, this is a, um, a, a long document and uh, haven't had a chance to, to, to read it, but in a way, in, in U.S. involvement in peacemaking, this is a return to the comprehensive approach as opposed to the step-by-step -step approach, an attempt to lay out uh, the, the final um, issues, tackle all the hard issues, which were usually left for, for, for future uh, discussions. Um, it's very detailed. It's, it's very pro-Israel. Um, it is, uh, there's a lot uh, unknown in, in Israeli politics about this. I mean, Netanyahu was there, but Netanyahu is now under indictment 
okay? He's going he's gonna to run for elections after he, he's no longer going to get immunity. He'll be running for elections under indictment for fraud and breach of trust and a, and a couple of other, other things. So what does that mean? Maybe that's why Trump asked Benny Gantz, his main opponent, to, to come to, to Washington and was present the, the day before it and is apparently uh, uh, briefed on this uh, a plan. I mean, I think um, Netanyahu, uh, he, um, uh, Gantz did not travel with Netanyahu. Uh, um, Netanyahu kind of, Netany um, Gantz flew commercially and, um, you know, again, we're in the world of social media. So what you see at the memes is, is um, you know, uh, Netanyahu is going in his, in his plane and everything, and, and Gantz is, uh, is just like the rest of us, is looking for a place to charge his iPhone, you know, and, the, and that's what the pictures that came out. And I think that's part of the, of the theater that uh, Netanyahu was, um, was interested in. Where does Egypt stand with respect to this relationship? So um, I, I don't know about, about the peace plan, but with respect to this relationship, uh, both Israel and, uh, and the Gulf countries uh, were very much opposed to uh, Morsi, the uh, Muslim brother, uh, Brotherhood uh, president of Egypt. And um, they are entirely supportive. Egypt is entirely supportive of this relationship. Israel has a very good uh, military relationship uh, with, uh, with Egypt. Uh, Israel cooperates with Egypt against, uh, against um, the Islamic State, which operates in the Sinai. Um, I, I believe Israel has even allowed Egypt, uh, given permission for Egypt to uh, go into the Sinai, uh, basically against the Camp David, uh, the, the peace treaty. I mean, not against, they've approved it, but uh, changed some arrangements there. They've allowed them to do that. And reportedly, Israel, Israel, actual, Israel actually flies over Egypt in support of the Egyptians who are fighting uh, ISIS. So uh, Egypt, uh, if it hasn't already, would give its blessings to, to the, the, the peace plan. I don't know, would give its blessings to this relationship is what I'm saying. Thank you. Hi, uh, Cole Bunzel of the Hoover Institution. Thanks also for your talk. Uh, I had a question about the Islamists in Saudi Arabia, uh, which is a subject I know you've written uh, a lot about, including a, a really great book in, in 2000, Holier Than Now. Um, and Curious, in particular, what accounts in your in your view for the decline of, of their influence, and uh, you know, the reason we're not even talking about them uh, today, because of course they're a uh, constituency that are opposed to any kind of rapprochement with with Israel. In, in the 1990s, you had popular Islamist protests um, in response to pro-Western uh, moves by the government. Um, so I was curious: Do you think there is a kind of fundamental cultural shift in the country, or is it mainly the, the heavy hand of MBS? Um, and just as a kind of side note, I know uh, Turkey and Bechil, your friend, uh, you published your book. Well, I've never met him, but uh, uh, okay. okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, he wrote a very fawning uh, book about uh, some, uh, some man, Al-Auda, uh, one of the leading uh, mm -hmm. Islamists that was in bookshelves just a few years ago. And I wonder how people like like that deal with this, this uh, change in policy. Well, I haven't seen him uh, refer specifically to this, this change in, in, in policy. Look, he's a... He's a government man, okay? So I, I would imagine that he's, uh, he's supported. He's now an, an, an ambassador. Um, with the Islamists, uh, most of them are in jail. I mean, the ones who I wrote about, Salman al-Auda and, and so forth. Um, the, uh, so you, you're not really hearing their voice very much now in Saudi Arabia on this issue. Um, Mohammed bin Salman comes down pretty hard on these guys. I mean, he is, will, uh, if this becomes an issue where, where it becomes above board, it's out of the clandestine space and they're about to recognize. So if these guys, uh, I, I would think that if these guys spoke up too much, uh, they would either be arrested or, as you're probably aware, um, over, overwhelmed on, in the uh, Twitter space by Saudi bots and, and so forth, where you know, they just get slammed and uh, their voice isn't, isn't heard. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they're not, uh, they're not really being heard on, on this issue. They're probably uh, um, wary of speaking out, but I, I doubt they support it and support the collect connection to Israel. I am wondering if Israeli embassy sent also 
uh, those kind of car to the Saudi Arabia for the happy, uh, happy Ramadan or something. Yeah. I, I don't know. This wasn't sent specifically to the Israeli embassy. This was just on the Twitter feed of the ambassador. But uh, Israelis uh, and Israeli officials, uh, every uh, Ramadan, Eid al Adha, Eid al Fitr, bless and give greetings to the Arab world. We see this all the time. Yeah. Sure. If I could ask uh, two questions directly. Let us tell everybody who you're Oh, Mike, uh, Farm State. Um, have you, I was wondering if you'd read these reports that India had used an NSO group tool to hack Jeff Bezos' phone and get your comments on that. And number two, I was wondering if um, these Israeli cybersecurity companies view themselves as arms dealers or as international business uh, diplomats. Hmm. Okay, so that's a bit out of my lane. Uh, but uh, I'll say a couple of things. I mean, these uh, these companies say that they are selling, you know, anti-terrorism software, that it's approved, uh, that it's government to government. It's uh, um, and uh, so I don't know how they view themselves. They really t tend to stay under the radar. They're not. They don't go public. They rarely uh, give interviews. Um, Jeff. Bezos owns the Washington Post, okay? Um, the Washington Post employed Jamal Khashoggi, who was murdered by, uh, by the Saudi regime. So um, I would say that's probably why he was targeted. Um, and apparently with software from an Israeli company that was sold. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, I think, a fact, yeah? What, how they view themselves I think they view themselves as a business. Okay. I do think this is this is some this is an area to watch though because, you know, Israel massively punches above its weight in the high tech sector, and especially in the digital domain. And you have legions. You know, every every eighteen year old hacker in Israel goes into the military for a while and then comes out and starts a company. Uh, and uh, Israel lives in a dangerous neighborhood. And it's increasingly sidled up to authoritarian regimes that want to incorporate as much of this technology as possible for the purposes of surveillance and social control. Mm -hmm. And I think that it, we're coming to a point where Israel is going to have to yeah, have a major reckoning about how much its values as a democratic state should shape the emerging business relationships it's having with these extraordinarily undemocratic countries who want to use high-tech Israeli tools to do really bad shit to their people. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, Silicon Valley has to reckon with that, too. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. Israel can't escape. As, as these ties happen below mm -hmm. the official ties, I don't think Israel can escape the conversation about whether its technologies are being used right. to do things yeah. that are very much at odds with Israel's core values as a democracy. Sure, as, as um, any democracy which is engaged in business and defense technologies and selling them has to be has to bring into its equation the, the usage uh, made of their technology, any country. So I, I, I'd agree on that. By the way, some of these young 18-year-olds, well, they're a little bit older, 18, when they go out of the army, um, uh, some of them apparently, if you read uh, Ronane Bergman's research, are, are hiring themselves out to, to other regimes, you know, as just taking their knowledge, which, which is illegal, okay? That is definitely illegal to, uh, to take stuff you learned in the, in the army and use that to, uh, commercially, although it's done, but uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Art Lieberman. I'm a member <coughs> of the community. Uh, I was curious to hear what you would say about Qatar, which you mentioned at the beginning. It seems to be aligned with this policy, yet mm -hmm. it seems almost there's a triangular relationship between Qatar, which has been isolated by Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. and yet Qatar is supporting the Palestinians both financially and also politically. So how, how does Qatar fit into this? Uh, yeah, um, okay. So uh, Qatar is, uh, is definitely um, an, an outlier. Um, it's an interesting country because it, it's, in a way, it's gone from being the country that was, was the most conciliatory towards Israel. A, a, Qatar and Oman opened low-level uh, diplomatic relations with Israel after uh, the signing of the, um, of the Oslo Accords. 
uh, and um, there was an Israeli uh, legation, some kind of diplomatic office in, um, in Qatar. But Qatar changed its policy. I, I don't have too much time to, to, to go into that, but it, it started uh, Al Jazeera. It started, it wanted to punch above its weight. It wanted to, um, to, to lead the Arab world, invest in, in, um, in, in leadership in the Arab world. Uh, and it eventually uh, started to lead the anti-Israel camp among, among the, 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 the Gulf countries. Um, but there is pragmatic cooperation with Qatar, okay? Qatar funnels a lot of money into the Gaza Strip and Qatari officials uh, enter the Gaza Strip. You can only do that through Israel uh, or through with Israeli approval. You can come into Egypt. That Israel has to allow this. Um, and uh, so they are... Qatar, with its money, helps lower the flames in Gaza ever so often. There's a big influx of, of, of money. Um, Qatar has donated money to Israeli soccer teams. There is Doha Stadium in Shfaram, I think. There's a, there's a stadium named uh, Amir Tamim, uh, or maybe it was his father, but, uh, but uh, there's a stadium named after uh, in Sakhnin. In Sakhnin, okay. Um, and uh, uh, so there, there's that. Um, on the other hand, Qatar uh, has been a place to, to house uh, uh, Azmi Bishara, who was uh, an Israeli Arab who uh, basically, let's say, ran away where he's charged with, with a treason and, and leads, uh, was in a very big villa there and uh, kind of is a spokesperson for Qatar and Arab media and, and, and so forth. So yeah, Qatar's an outlier here. It's, it's, uh, it's at odds with Saudi Arabia, as, as you've said. Um, but there is pragmatic cooperation with Israel. Hey, Gideon from the community. Can you elaborate a Russia interest in this relationship? Yeah. Um, so, you know, Russia is, we won't call it a new actor in the Middle East, but it's a newly strengthened actor in the Middle East. Certainly, uh, Russia is taking up a lot of uh, slack uh, uh, from the United States. Um, Israel operates, when I said Israel kind of functions like a proxy for the, uh, the Gulf countries when it's attacking Iran or Hezbollah, um, Israel can only do that with Russian approval because it's operating in Russian airspace. Okay, so in a way here, Russia is, 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 part, of that, is part of that game. Russia is you know, interested in the Gulf. Russia is, uh, I, I think, uh, um, uh, Mohammed bin Salman maybe two, three months ago visited Russia. So there is, as the, the U.S. profile drops, there is, uh, there is more interest in, in Russia. There is more interest in China. So you'll, you'll see them being more active in, in the area. Others? Yes, I'm Loretta. I've taken class here in foreign policy before. Um, uh, could you elaborate more on the what you said about the rehabilitation of Judaism in the Gulf countries? Sure. Um, if you looked at uh, Saudi textbooks, um, and they're probably still like that, but uh, the the antipathy towards Judaism is 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 very strong. There are all kinds of mythologies or or, or hadith that are quoted. They're very anti-Jewish, very anti-Semitic about the characteristics of the Jews, um, uh, about uh, Jews cannot be associated with, uh, that, uh, that uh, one can't trust Jews. Protocols of Elders of Zion, again, is, is, is available in bookstores throughout the Arab world. Um, but you see, again, this is, is still embryonic, but, but you see... Uh, more openness towards Judaism, towards discussing Judaism, towards the, the real, uh, real commonalities that, that do exist between Judaism and, and Islam. And um, I know of two uh, Saudis who teach Hebrew in Saudi Arabia. One's a graduate of Brandeis University, um, and uh, his classes are, are, are well attended. I, I know that. And, uh, you know, language is a way when you learn about a, another country, another religion. Um, so it, again, it's embryonic, but, 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 but you see it. And, and I'm told by Saudis who I, I'm in contact with that, um, we not, we, we, they, they thirst to know more about Judaism. 
Okay, that's why Elhanan Miller's uh, YouTube page, and you, you can check it out, is, is, is so popular. I mean, it's using animation. It's, it's, it's also some of, it's, it's co-hosted with an uh, Israeli Muslim woman who, uh, who uh, also is explaining about J Judaism. And, um, you know, you fa Jews fast on these occasions, Muslims fast on these, this in common. Um, Israelis are, are uh, in, in, in this, uh, in, in this uh, uh, YouTube channel are, are quoting the Quran and showing the commonalities and explaining. And, and I'd also say that since um, Elhanan is a rabbi, um, or not because a rabbi is a very knowledgeable Jew, um, this is coming from the perspective of a, of a, a religious Jew. Okay, so someone with a deep knowledge and a, and, a, and a practicing religious Jew, so who really knows about the prayers, who do, does the prayers, who observes the, I don't know, the Jewish dietary laws and, and keeps the Sabbath. And so, and so it comes across his, um, you know, his, his own conviction about his own religion as he's explaining what's common um, in Islam. And so, so what I'm saying is Saudi, so I'm in contact with, with, with tell me that, uh, this helps them think in a more positive way about Israel, to think in a positive way about Judaism. And we're just getting started. Well, uh, please join me in thanking Josh uh, Tuttle. Thank you.